Hi, everyone. So today, authentication. Before we start, uh, just some admin. Today, assignment two is going to be due at midnight. Um, how is that going for everybody? It's good. Who, uh, who's not finished with it still? OK. How is the CSP stuff, specifically? It's OK. OK. Uh, someone else? Anyone else? How is that? Yeah. It's pretty rough. Really? Uh, and I went to the talk tower yesterday, and that helped a little bit with some discussing of some CSP stuff. But uh, my biggest takeaway was this is why people don't use it. <laughs> really? OK. <laughs> I'm like, I'm understanding it. Okay. Darn. The, the whole point of, of, the, of having those questions on there was like to make you all feel confident. Like, I can use CSP when I build my website. That's too bad. <laughs> oh, man. OK. Um, so some ideas we've been thinking about is maybe doing like a, a re like sort of a review session on CSP specifically to help with getting through the homework. Um, is, would that be useful for people? Like, so it's, is it just the CSP stuff, or is there other uh, other parts of it that are hard as well? Mostly the CSP. Mostly the CSP. Okay. Okay. Um, so we uh, Esther, we can talk about doing that maybe. Um, we raise your hand if you would attend a review session on CSP. Okay. Okay, so maybe we can do that before Thursday. Okay, how about this? We'll extend the assignment deadline to Thursday. Okay, and so it'll be midnight on Thursday. <laughs> okay, that probably helps a lot of you with midterms this week too. So, okay. All right, so, so assignment will be due on Thursday at 11.59, and we'll, we'll uh, try to announce a time and a place for a review session on CSP. Also, there's office hours that Esther's holding on Wednesday, and I'm holding my usual ones on Thursday as well after class. Uh, so those are always available as well. OK. All right, great. Um, any other issues with the homework or anything like that you want to talk about? OK, cool. So, so Thursday, uh, we're having a guest lecture uh, by uh, somebody named Lucas Guerin. Um, he was my year at Stanford, um, and he was a, a, fellow, a fellow section leader, so he's really cool. Um, he, uh, he, he's going to talk about WebAuthN. Um, and a fun little fact about him is that, uh, remember the uh, preload list uh, that Emily was wearing on her body? So he was actually the one who was responsible for maintaining the website for that list, the H HSTS preload.org site. So you go to the site, you type in your domain, and it would verify that you, know, you had the right uh, HSTS header, and that, then it would go to him for like a review. And so, he was literally seeing the, the sort of the list get bigger every day. That was his job at Google. <laughs> so um, we can we can hassle him about that when he gets here. We can blame him for it. Um, cool. Yeah, but that'll be interesting. Um, so WebAuthN is is a way for the browser to um, a way for the browser to interact with different authentication devices on the machine. Um, so things like the fingerprint sensor, face ID sensor, um, and physical hardware tokens in a, in a standardized way. So it's really cool. Um, and they're using it at GitHub. All right, so yeah, so today our topic is authentication. And the question we should keep in mind when talking about authentication <laughs> is how can we build systems which are secure even when the attacker has the user's password? Um, so this is, seems like a hard problem, a uh, hard challenge we've set for ourselves. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that um, you know, one of the themes of this class is like defense in depth and being resilient even in the case of like one of our systems failing, right? So we, we want to think about what we can do, how can we not fail so drastically when, when an attacker actually has a user's password. Um, yeah, okay, so let's review what is authentication. So authentication is when we're trying to figure out that a user is who they say they are. So that's the big idea. Is the user who they say they are? Uh, typically, you, you'll do this by checking something about the user. Um, so, so it could be something that the user knows, so a password that the user knows and has in their, in their brain that they, that they present to you. Or it could be something that they have, uh, something physical that they have, like a phone, an ID badge, or some kind of a cryptographic key that they possess. And it could also be something that they are, so something physical about them, like their fingerprint, their retina, or any kind of other biometric data about the person. Uh, I was just reading. A news, a news story about interesting new sources of biometric data that, that are being used by uh, governments and other sort of uh, I interesting actors. Uh, there, so there's, there's, there's now like gate is actually a biometric uh, a data point that you can use to detect a user. So literally based on how you walk, 
um, nothing, you know, if nothing other than that information, they can figure out that it's you because it's, it's unique enough, which is sort of terrifying. Um, uh, what was the other front one that was kind of funny? There was, oh yeah, there was a, an experimental, so some, some Japanese car company was doing experiments on how to uh, reduce car theft, and one of the things that, this didn't ship, but it's kind of a funny idea, was they could actually um, detect the shape of your rear end on the seat, <laughs> and then just like not start the car if it's <laughs> different. <laughs> Uh, they said it was really accurate. They said it was something like 99% accuracy, but they didn't release it. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> that seems pretty good to me. Yeah. So what if like, kind of like most of the drivers like, you know, how to be logical, like, you know? Yeah. I mean, maybe if you're paranoid, you turn this on, right? Like, okay, I only want my, you know, I only want these two drivers to be able to drive, but like anyone else can't, right? Um, uh, yeah. What else? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, in emergency situations, then somebody else couldn't drive your car also. That's kind of not ideal, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the thing about biometric data that's, that's, not, that's not ideal is that it's not changeable. So if, if your biometric data gets stolen, you can't reset it. So that's something to keep in mind. You can always change you know, your phone, um, or you know, if your computer gets hacked, you can, um, you can you know, put new cryptographic keys on it, right? But you can't like, change your fingerprint. Uh, this is one of the reasons why a lot of systems that do this kind of biometric authentication, they actually they do it on device, and they don't send the biometric data to the remote service. So um, I don't know how it works on Android, but on, on iPhone at least, anytime you use Touch ID or Face ID, that data stays on the, that data stays on the iPhone, and you're actually just um, using that biometric proof to unlock a key store, and then there's a cryptographic key in there that, uh, that you can use to actually authenticate. Um, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And that's actually how WebAuthn is going to do it as well. That's the browser authentication thing I mentioned earlier that uh, Lucas is going to talk about. You wouldn't want to actually send that to the server. Um, yeah, so the more factors that we use uh, out of these three categories of factors, the more sure we are that a user is who they say they are. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so if you think about like approaching an ATM, um, what do you do at an ATM? Well, you, you, you provide two of those factors. You provide, um, usually you provide something that you have, so like the ATM card, and then you also provide something that you know, which is the ATM pin. Um, so that's a sort of two-factor uh, authentication. Um, you don't typically, as far as I know, scan your fingerprint or do any kind of <laughs> other uh, biometric authentication. Uh -huh. Mm. Is the premise like you have no idea like what service that it's tied to, so like you can't really, like you don't know the username that it's tied to, so it doesn't really help you? Or that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I th I think like if somebody, so if, if an attacker gets your specific key and they know that it's yours, then that factor is like useless, right? So hopefully you have other factors. Like hopefully they still don't know your password, or hopefully they don't, um, you know, they don't also have your f your finger or your face, like. Handy, <laughs> um, but, but uh, no, actually, that's a good question. I don't know what you can actually get off of the devices um, if you phys have physical access to them. I imagine they try to do this stuff to be tamper-proof to like in inspection, but I actually, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, Yeah, okay, so, so one thing to point out is the difference between uh, authentication and authorization. So these terms sound kind of similar, they're pretty different, um, so don't get them confused. So authentication is when you're verifying that a user is who they say they are, and then authorization is deciding, once you know who a user is, whether they should be allowed to do something. So make sure you know the difference. Uh, so authentication is you know a login form, a cookie, uh, some type of authentication over HTTP, uh, it's any of the, the types of, uh, of authentication we've already mentioned, so biometric or uh, something you know or something you have. Um, and then authorization is all handled with, uh, typically with, you know, a, some kind of an ACL. An ACL is just, uh, the idea is like, here's a user and here's what they can do. And you have a big list of all the things that, you know, all your users and all the things that they can do. Um, and then we also do capability URLs, that's the other kind of authorization we've seen. Uh, that's that's a, a term for the, the, the unique token inside of a Google Docs URL that makes the Google Docs URL sort of, uh, the URL itself be kind of enough to, um, unlock access to the, to the Google Doc. Um, so that's called the capability URL. Cool, so um, if you look up the NIST guidelines on, uh, on authentication, you'll, you'll, you'll see that they, they point this out. So uh, authentication doesn't determine the a claimant's authorizations or access privileges. So you wanna think of the two as pretty separate. You don't want to confuse the two or put the two, you know, accidentally mix up the two things. So 
you know, when, you, when you're um, giving out a session ID to a user, you give them an ID, and then any time they provide that ID to you, you then go and look up to see whether they're authorized to do the thing they're trying to do. You don't give them, uh, you don't give them some kind of, uh, of um, token which says, I'm allowed to do this, 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 and this, right? Even if you were able to sign that, it's kind of a token, uh, there'd be no way to expire it. There'd be no way to update it if, uh, if, if the authorizations changed, or sorry, not the authorizations, the, yeah, the authorizations. If the authorizations changed, you wouldn't be able to sort of update that. Yeah, so that's good to know. Um, okay, so, some, so now we're gonna just go over a bunch of like implementation mistakes you can make when you're building authentication into your web app. So um, first off, just username mistakes you can make. So usernames should be stored case insensitively. Um, it's kind of obvious, you know, if you type in different cases, it's the same user, but make sure that you're actually storing it that way in your database. Um, if you don't do that, then you might accidentally have two users, one that's like lowercase f for us and one that's capital F for us. That's not good. Um, furthermore, you should actually enforce that those usernames are unique. So um, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't let a second user register um, with the same name. If you do that, then uh, you know, unclear what will happen, but it's not good. Um, uh, you can also, if you want to make the, if, if the user does sort of type in their username with capitals, what you can do is you can actually create like a second column in the table and uh, list, uh, save how they prefer the, their, their username to be capitalized while also saving the lowercase version in another column. That way when you actually go, to, when they go to type in a username, no matter what they type, you lowercase it and you compare it to the lowercase column. And then when you actually render their username in the UI, you render their, their preferred case version. Cool. Um, so let's talk about passwords now. So that was usernames. So passwords, with passwords, users just choose terrible passwords. That's just a fact. Um, this is the list of top, pa top 10 passwords over uh, a bunch of years, and you can see it alternates between password and one, two, three, four, five, six. So user's not doing too good there. Um, it's pretty embarrassing. Raise your hand if your password is any of the ones on this list. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, you're, all too, you're all too smart. Um, yeah, so it's not good. Um, I don't have newer data on this, but I'm sure it's, it's not improved. Um, so one thing that people try to do to mitigate this is, is to create password requirements. And so you do this on the server side. You, you, you refuse to let a user register if they don't have a password that's to your satisfaction. Um, and um, the question is, what should these requirements be? So for a long time, um, all of our guidance was, was based off of, uh, of, of, of advice like this. Uh, so, so this is PCI, which is the industry group that creates the standards for how credit card information should be stored, and um, they have a, a, a sort of a spec or a standard out called, called uh, the DSS that, ha that has this beautiful graphic in it. It talks about how you should change your passwords regularly um, and treat them like a toothbrush. Don't let anyone else use them and get new ones every three months. So uh, how many of you change your passwords every three months? Like no one, right? So. Uh, it's really outdated advice, but yet you still see this like in, you know, even in, in and this is like, this is the thing I just screenshotted like this week. So it's, it, this is like advice they're still giving out, right? So it's, it's not practical. Um, and typically when you, when you ask users to do something like change their password every three months, they just t tack on a number on the end and rotate that number. And so it's, it ends up uh, not actually uh, doing, doing much and just, and just uh, creating, creating needless work. Uh, the other thing you see a lot is this advice to select passwords that have um, a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols. And you know, the, the, the site will refuse to let you select a password that doesn't have all that stuff. And that's also outdated advice. So you'll see it a lot, but um, you'll actually, um, you actually don't want, want to, we'll talk about what you should do instead, but that's not, a, that's not really a good requirement. Don't, don't do that on any of the sites that you build, please. And while I was looking for this graphic, I also found a much more hilarious graphic uh, that talks about how you should Treat your passwords not like a toothbrush, but like underwear. Um, never share them with anyone. Uh, keep them off of your desk and change them often. Um, there's all kinds of, if you, if you start going on Google image search, you'll find all kinds of ridiculous like metaphors for what you should think of your passwords like. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. But this is from a university um, putting out this advice. Yeah, so here's, uh, here's the sort of outdated requirements that you might see. So, you know, um, ensure your passwords are complex, where complexity is defined as like a combination of numeric, alphabetic, both uppercase, lowercase characters in com combination with, uh, with special symbols, forcing users to change their passwords regularly, and then requiring that, th that, that a user select a password they've never selected before. So that there you actually have the site saving a history of passwords you've selected and then preventing you from sort of reusing uh, passwords. And they usually do that in combination with, with forcing you to change it every three months. So that way you can't like, go back to one you used last month and, alter, or, you know, last time you changed it and alternate. Um, and then they, they, would, they, would, they would give like this like as an example of a good password. So sort of swapping in like symbols and, and numbers in, in, in certain, for certain letters. 
Um, so those are bad practices, outdated practices. These are absolutely terrible practices. Definitely don't do any of these things. These are things that real sites do that are just awful. So if, if, if you've seen a site, like typically it's a bank for whatever reason, will have a maximum length on passwords. Um, typically it's because they have some legacy system that can't handle passwords that are longer than that for, for whatever reason. So they'll actually cap your password at 10 characters. Or what they'll do is they'll, they'll actually um, just truncate it. They'll let you think that you've typed in a longer password, but it's actually, you're not getting the security of all those extra characters. The other thing that, I, that I've heard of, which is absolutely horrendous, is um, there is a, there was a bank that let you log in over the phone using um, the touch the touchpad. And the thing about the touchpad is you only have numbers, and the numbers are mapped to you know every number is mapped to three letters, right? So the number two is like ABC, and three is um, you know DEF, right? So what they did was, in the back end, they would whatever pa whatever letters you chose for your password, they would Trans translated into the numbers rep represented on the on the keypad, and so you lose sort of all that entropy, and you just end up with like some you know sequence of whatever uh, you know digits, however many digits you have in your you have uh, you know, how many characters you have in your password, you get the digits for that, and then they store that, uh, and so that means that like a whole bunch more passwords can get into your account. Um, and so somebody confirmed this by sort of swapping a couple of letters in their password based on you know. This, choosing the same number on their phone, and they were able to get into their account. So that's horrible. <laughs> um, but there's all kinds of these horror stories if you if you look at there. All kinds of crazy things you can do that are bad. Um, yeah, it's wild. Um, and so then there's there's also a minimum password age policy I've seen. So you can't change your password too much. And the idea there is like they, they don't want people to sort of dodge the requirement to change their password regularly by like changing it to something and then swapping it back. Um, that's really bad if you if, you know if you lose your password or you get it exposed you, want, you need to be able to change it now not like a week from now right so that's really bad um, how many of you have you seen have you how many of you have seen uh, sites that disable cut and paste on a form before okay yeah that's also really bad uh, I think the idea there is like oh well if the user's saving their password in a text file then uh, you know they're being really bad so we should not let them copy paste in but of course this completely breaks password managers where you are all, all the time copying and pasting things in um, so that's really bad. And then password hints are really easy to do wrong. So a lot of times password hints just don't have enough entropy. Uh, so there's, uh, there's an airlines that uh, all of you probably know that does this, where they'll actually um, they'll have a, a, a set of uh, hint questions, and the answers are just a set of eight options that you select from a drop-down menu. And so you know, that, that isn't very good proof that it's actually you. Uh, when, you know, the, the attacker can try, and there's like, you know, they have a one in eight chance of like getting it right. Um, they do combine it with like two or three questions, but it's, it's still, it's, it's, too, it's too small of a set of, 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 of questions. Um, and, uh, you know, if that's a way into your account, then you've now created this sort of much, much weaker way to get into your account than the actual strong password that you've selected. Um, so that's not good. And then, this is also another terrible one. Um, this is such a misguided idea. The idea is like, say you have a keylogger installed on your computer that's saving all the keystrokes that you type, and it's sending all the, all the keys that you press to some attacker. Well, what if we solve that by having a keyboard pop up on the screen, and you can use your mouse to click on the, the letters and numbers in your password? Then an attacker won't be able to get that. But the problem is, I mean, yeah, maybe this is effective against literally a keylogger, right? But of course, a real attacker can just screenshot, you know, record your screen and send that to them, or they can, they can implement a custom way to sort of intercept the clicks on this keyboard, like, they're, you know, you're, you're kind of owned in that, at that point. And this just creates like so many usability issues for normal users who want to log in. So anyway, just wanted to point out the really terrible things that you should never do. Um, they're, not, they're not good, even though they're often claimed to be done for security reasons. Yeah, question? One thing I've seen is they'll, they'll, if you have a phone that's paired with a the device, they'll sometimes have, let, let you type it in on your phone. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I agree with you. I don't know what you do about that. Hopefully you trust your friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, this is another, another practice that isn't really used anymore, fortunately. But uh, how many of you have seen this, this idea of an ID shield or a secure ID? Okay. Yeah, the idea here is like, if, if, if the idea is to help the user detect that they're on a phishing page. And the way you do this is when the user creates an account, they select an image. It's supposed to be their own image. No one else has, or you know, not that many other people have. And uh, any time they go to the bank site and they type in their username, the bank will show the image that they selected. And the idea is a phishing site wouldn't be able to do this because the phishing site wouldn't know what image the user selected. And so you can detect a phishing page. Um, what are some problems with this? Can anyone? Yeah. Right, 
Right, just, just, just omit an image or show like a broken image icon or something. The user will think, oh, the site must not be working, whatever. And remember from Emily's, uh, what Emily mentioned in the talk last Thursday was that positive UI indicators often are ignored by users. So totally right, yeah. Any other reasons why this is bad? Yeah? Yeah, it'll, it'll literally be only one image. Yeah, but you're totally right. Yeah. So this is this. By the way, this is the selection page where the user gets to pick the image they want. And it's only one image, so it's even easier than what you said. The, the, the attacker literally just goes to the bank, types in your user, the, the victim's username, and then an image comes up, and they just they sort of load that into their their phishing page dynamically. Yeah. So it doesn't work. Um, maybe it helped at one point. I don't know. I, 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 but but uh, but the data is really bad. So there, there's a study done. Uh, uh, I think this is pretty recent. Uh, on the effectiveness of these security images. And if you look just in the abstract, you can see it's pretty bad. Um, so yeah, 73, the majority of participants, 73% entered their password when we removed the security image and caption. Uh, okay, so there's also a caption that the user can type underneath it, like some text that they came up with. And so that's really bad. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so th that's typically not used anymore. Um, it's kind of a security feeder fake security kind of thing. Um, yeah, OK, so some things we've learned about password requirements since, uh, since the days when th those old requirements were being given out is that complex isn't necessarily strong. So uh, numeric, alphabetic, special symbols, forcing the user to use these in their password doesn't lead to stronger passwords. Uh, and um, and um, this quote sort of summarizes that. Choosing multiple words. Uh, so this is sort of an alternative idea. It's choose multiple words from a suitably large dictionary of words. And, uh, and if you do that, you, you'll end up with stronger passwords, even if all the words appear in dictionaries and are spelled with lowercase letters and no punctuation is used. So literally, you can just pick like four words from a dictionary, and that's going to give you more entropy than putting all kinds of symbols into your password. Um, yeah, and, uh, and then if you're worried about users, despite, you know, despite the fact that, uh, so say you lift these requirements from your, from your site. You say, you know what, choose whatever you want. You don't have to pick symbols and numbers. Users might really do some, d some dumb things at that point. So one thing you can do is instead of, uh, instead of just hoping that this requirement protects the users, is just go and check the passwords against known leaked breach data. So there's all these, these uh, databases of uh, user passwords that have leaked in uh, all these breaches that you hear about in the news. And you can literally just have a, a, a database of that and query against that whenever the user tries to choose a password. And so this is actually much. This is actually the NIST, the current NIST recommendation. So they've eliminated, at least NIST has eliminated this as a as a good suggestion, and they now just suggest checking against known breach data instead. Um, so that's the way to do it going forward. Um, they also don't recommend changing passwords regularly anymore, um, and, and length is the primary factor that we care about now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, really good point. I mean, if you think about it, what this is, what the, I mean, if, if you assume over time every, every database gets breached, <laughs> like this, let's just assume that, or like, like some percentage of them are going to get breached, then uh, effectively by saying your users can't pick a password that's in a breach, you're basically saying that they can't pick a password that anyone has picked before, right? And um, that's, that means they might not, might not even be able to pick their own password that they use on other sites, um, which, which maybe they shouldn't be doing that anyway, but... Um, but they wouldn't be able to pick even their own password if that password was in a breach, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect solution. All these things are a balance between you know, usability and security. So if you, if you have this policy, then you're going to be restricting a bunch of users who just like, don't care. They just, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe your service is kind of like not security sensitive service. Like it's, uh, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, pick something that doesn't really matter, right? Um, a lot of people don't care about their Netflix password, right? Even though there's like viewing history in there. You know, may maybe Netflix just doesn't want to bother forcing users to, to you know, not cho choose a breached password because the, the consequences are very low, right? And we're going to talk about other things you can do in combination with passwords that, um, that, uh, uh, that will give you security even if you, like, let them pick one that you know has been breached. Uh, by the way, the reason why we care about, it be b we care about them picking a password that's been breached is that uh, uh, people who are attacking um, a, a, a breached uh, database or, or who are doing sort of who are who are sort of trying all the possible passwords in an online attack are, are going to be using the, the breach lists as their sources of passwords to try because these are more likely to be real user passwords that's why we care uh, and then of course I bet a bunch of you have already seen this but it's obligatory I have to show you this is the X, XKCD about uh, how to choose passwords uh, so I'll give you a minute to read it
But yeah, basically, you know, you can try to do all these things like substitutions, using numerals, throwing in some punctuation, but you see the number of bits of entropy that you get are, are quite small for, the, for those uh, things that you throw in. And this is, of course, this is assuming that users follow a specific pattern of pick an English word, swap in some common substitutions, and then tack on a symbol and a number at the end. There's obviously, that's not the way, that's not the pattern that all passwords follow, but like there's, there's not that many of them. It's typically something like that. Um, and so you can add a bit more entropy for those other patterns, but you end up with like not that much in the end. You end up with sort of this password being able to be guessed in three days using a, th a thousand guesses a second. Uh, whereas if you just picked four words, you know, you, you have way much, you know, you have a lot more um, entropy and a lot longer for the password to be guessed. And it's much easier to remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's the idea. Um, so if you, if you have trouble picking words, you can use a password manager and they'll pick the four words for you. And uh, sometimes the, the words they pick are really funny. Um, so it's kind of amusing. Um, cool. So, so yeah, in general, user passwords are just way too short. Um, and this is a mapping of sort of password length to how long it takes to crack the password. And this is assuming that you have a password using uppercase, lowercase, and number characters. Um, not, no symbols, but um, that doesn't change it that much. Uh, but you can see here, basically, if you're, not, if you're using something less than like 12 characters, you're kind of in trouble. Um, if somebody really wants to find out your password, they're going to be able to find it out. Um, and we'll talk about like how, how exactly they would do that in a second. Um, but yeah, um, if, if your password's shorter than this, go change it now. <laughs> Any questions about this? Okay, cool. So, uh, so yeah, just, uh, there's a cool site I want to just show really quick. This is a, a sort of site that lets you type in a, an example password, and you can sort of just see uh, the time it takes to crack it. So it's quite interesting. So like this password, uh, you know, maybe we'll add a one or an exclamation point or something. But you see like, uh, oh, this, this is the interesting thing. There's three sort of attack scenarios we care about. The online attack scenario, this is where the user is, is literally, the, the attacker is literally uh, sending requests to, your, to the, the server with potential username and password combinations. And so this is going to be inherently like uh, very limited by the sort of amount of requests they can send to the server without getting blocked or without getting noticed. And so the assumption here is 1,000 guesses a second, which is very, a very generous assumption. You know, most services that are watching login attempts are not going to let you try 1,000 things per second. Um, uh, so yeah, even in that, that generous assumption, you know, like this, is a, this is actually a good password, right? Um, this is assuming you're exhaustively searching the space. Uh, uh, and not using a list of known passwords, which would, would, that would actually significantly shorten the, number, the amount of time it would take to guess this. Um, and then you have these other two scenarios that are offline, which, is, uh, which, is, which becomes relevant when somebody has stolen a database of, of hashed passwords, and they need to sort of go through and try to sort of reverse the hash function and figure out the original password. Um, and when they do that, they can go much faster because they're just doing it locally. They don't need to talk over the network. And the two scenarios here are just like, this is sort of like an average kind of an individual computer uh, how fast can you can you break passwords on, on like a normal computer? And then this is if you build a cracking array of computers where you sort of buy a bunch of GPUs, you spend like twenty thousand um, dollars, and uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually not, right? A company can easily buy this, an attacker, a government, this is like nothing for for, for those types of um, of, uh, of attackers. And so yeah, th then you see here that it's like totally crackable, um, very very fast. Whereas if we put in um, correct course battery staple, it's like you know, I mean, you're good. Uh, right, anyway, uh, this is cool. Uh, I don't recommend putting your real password in here, even though they promise that they don't send it to their server, but you know, it's still fun to play with this site. Cool, uh, any questions about this? Yeah? I guess if this becomes too common, could they not just use a mask where they're like dictionary word, dictionary word, dictionary word, dictionary word, and just like guess that? So uh, if, you, if you assume that, uh, you, like, say you know the pattern of the, of the user you're attacking, you know that they did dictionary word, dash dictionary word, like you said. Um, if, 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 let's even assume you know the dictionary that they're using, that they're choosing the words from, right? Um, so you could assume it's like 20,000 words or something like that. Um, you can do the math and see that even in that situation, you're actually totally fine, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, there's, I might have a slide about it. I don't, I don't remember if I do, but... Um, but yeah, even, so you, you want to you you assume that the attacker knows exactly the scheme you're using and exactly the dictionary you're using, and you want to be safe even in that situation. Yeah. And I think forwards does that. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, so here's the current sort of best practices that we, that we recommend. Um, so you want to allow um, uh, the user to pick really long passwords, potentially up to 64 characters. But you, you, um, you also want to enforce some kind of a minimum length. So eight is like the bare minimum. Like don't let them go below eight. But, uh, but even that is like kind of low. 
Um, and then other thing to keep in mind, don't allow unlimited length. Um, don't get sort of gung-ho and think like, oh, well, let them pick whatever they want, want really long, because um, you can actually get password denial of service, where, that, where the hash function takes uh, just way too long. It's not expecting an input that long. Um, you can mitigate that by hashing the password first before you, like with a fast hash function, but, um, but just, just don't let them pick passwords that long and you'll be fine. Uh, one gotcha to keep in mind is, we'll talk about bcrypt a little bit later, but bcrypt is, the, is one of the most popular hashing functions that people use to hash passwords, and it has a maximum length of 72 ASCII characters, which is quite short, because um, we, we were recommending here that you do at least 64 characters as a, as a maximum length, and oftentimes you might want to do you know, 128 or whatever, 1,000. And uh, if you do that, then bcrypt will just chop off the, the, the remainder. Um, and also, these are ASCII characters, and you typically, you, you should allow a user to type in whatever they want as their password, any kind of Unicode uh, symbol, emojis, you could have emoji passwords. And if you do that, you're going to get far fewer than 72 characters. So um, that's a gotcha you should keep in mind. The fix there is to hash the password first before you put it into, into bcrypt. So you hash it with something, some other hash function first. Uh, and then like I said, you should check the passwords against known breach data. And you should definitely rate limit the authentication attempts. So users can't just sit there all day trying, trying a bunch of passwords. Uh, and then, of course, encourage or require use of a second factor, depending on how sensitive the, app, the web app that you're building is. So if it's really, really sensitive, it's something like financial, then just require a second factor for, for logging in. Otherwise, just heavily encourage it. Yeah. So. When you're doing this, some common implementation mistakes are don't silently truncate long passwords. That's the, that's the gotcha that bcrypt will just do that. Um, uh, but don't, don't, don't do that yourself also in any code that you write. Uh, don't restrict the characters that users can choose. So allow Unicode, allow white space. Um, and this is a big one. Uh, don't accidentally include passwords in plain text log files. This is the thing that's just bitten a bunch of companies really recently. So Facebook and Twitter were in the news for this very, very recently. Basically, you know, the idea here is, say you include some logging code that's like, anytime I get an HTTP request, I'm just going to log it to a file because like, I might want to look at that later. You know, maybe it's interesting in some way. Maybe, you know, um, uh, maybe our server was attacked and we want to sort of just have a log of all the HTTP requests that came through. So we'll just log it. But remember, users are sending you their password in an HTTP post, right? And so you don't want to log that out. So uh, your logging has to be sensitive to that. And uh, it turns out, like at Facebook, um, a bunch of their logs uh, were just logging out people's passwords for years and years, since like 2012, I think, is what this article said. So, uh, and the problem with that is that, of course, now you know, imp uh, engineers at the company are allowed to go view logs, right? So it's, it's viewing, a lo viewing, viewing logs is like sort of a par part, daily part of, of, of the job of being an engineer. And so in theory, any engineer at you know, Facebook could have, could have seen passwords in plain text. Um, and then, um, you know, you can take a password and use it on another service or something like that and get into someone's account or use it on Facebook itself, right? Um, yeah, so this is really bad. Um, yeah, anything else I want to say about this? Um, hmm. Yeah, any, any questions? Cool, okay, so uh, what else did I say? Oh yeah, and obviously use, use TLS for all traffic, of course. Uh, encrypt all your traffic. Um, okay, so now let's talk about uh, network-based guessing attacks. So, so, um, so let's assume that you know you have you implemented a system. Um, your users are picking strong passwords. Uh, so, so now we need to think about what will happen if an attacker sort of just over the internet just sort of tries a bunch of passwords for a user that they're trying to target. How can we defend against this? Um, so, uh, so, so certain systems where where you have um, uh, users. Uh, uh, well, I guess this, what this is saying is actually is that in a system where, where, where a key is chosen completely randomly, you can, you can ensure that there's some, some sort of security in the, in the way the key is chosen, but when you let users select passwords, there's no way to get that guarantee. And so even in that situation, we want to ensure that uh, we, can, we can protect users. Because, um, yeah, the kind, of the kind of password that a user will select is going to come from a very small sort of set of all the possible passwords that we could have. Um, and so we need some defenses in place to prevent uh, uh, attackers iterating over all possible passwords that are like really short or really obvious. Um, and so the three ways that they do this are these are the three main types of, of network-based attacks, um, brute force, credential stuffing, and password spraying. Um, so they're all kind of related, but they're, they're just sort of subtle distinctions between the two. So with brute force, the idea is you just have some list, a dictionary, uh, and you're, 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 you know, or, 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 uh, or you're just iterating over all possible passwords to target a specific account. Uh, credential stuffing is where you, you, you take the data from a breach of another site um, and you try all the usernames and passwords that were in that breach on another site. So the idea is like users commonly reuse passwords. So if I saw like, oh, somebody was using this username and password on site A, they might be using it on site B. So let me just try it, right? And you just go through the list and the attacker just tries all of those um, and hope, hopes that some of them work, hopes that some of those passwords are in common between the two sites. And then password spraying 
is where you just say, I know this is a really weak password that users like to choose, and I'm just going to try it on every account that I know that is on, that is on this site. So just different variations on how to try uh, usernames and passwords. Cool. So, um, so defenses are, like, uh, the most obvious one is to rate limit the rate at which an attacker can make authentication attempts. So um, in, in, in Express, there's actually a really easy package you can install if you're using Node.js. You, it's called like Express Rate Limiter. And all you have to do is make sure that any route in your app which is doing authentication uh, runs through this uh, rate limiting code or this rate limiting middleware. Um, and what that will, will do is basically just keep track of which usernames uh, are um, being attempted, like which usernames someone is attempting to log into and uh, ensure that, uh, that uh, there's not too many attempts for that username in a given time. Another way to do it is to look at the IP address of the attacker and make sure that, that a given IP address isn't making too many attempts in a certain period of time. And then what do you do when you see that someone's doing this? Well, you can either delay them and just like, uh, hold the request and don't respond for some period of time, or you can just return a rejection, like some kind of an HTTP code that tells them you're, t you're going too fast, slow down. I'm not going to accept any more authentication requests. Cool. So this is pretty easy to do. Um, yeah, it's worth doing it. Another thing you can do is throw up some kind of a way to, to ask the user to prove that they're a real person. Um, and if, you can, if, if, they, if they successfully prove that they're a real person, then maybe you, you unblock them and you let them continue to make more attempts. Um, so one common way to do that is a CAPTCHA. You all have probably seen this before. Um, the full name is Completely Automated Public Touring Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart, which I didn't know until I made this slide, which is pr it's, it's a pretty hilarious acronym. Um, it's also co commonly known as a reverse Turing test. Uh, and this is how sort of early CAPTCHAs looked. But um, ones you've, you've seen are probably more, um, well, we'll get to that in a sec. But, uh, but this type of CAPTCHA was sort of com completely just sort of uh, at least a couple of the co common implementations of that type of CAPTCHA were completely destroyed in this paper uh, that was published in 2003, um, where th there was these two specific implement implementations, Easy Gimpy and um, what's the other one? Uh, Gimpy, I guess. Um, man, open source packages, that was choose interesting names. Um, but yeah, so the, 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 the breakage rate is really high. It's 92% for one of them and then 33% for the other. And remember, with a CAPTCHA, usually you're given more than one attempt. So, so even succeeding 33% of the time is actually more than enough. And typically, the, the, the people who write papers about this stuff, they look for 1% breakage. If you have 1% breakage, then it's sort of broken. Um, so this is, this is completely broken um, in this paper. Um, so uh, the other problems are just sort of how users experience CAPTCHAs. Like, you can do... You can do one in about 10 seconds, which is like a huge amount of human time to be wasting. Um, it's also difficult for users, users with visual impairment. Um, and so then in, in t typically a site will offer like an alternative capture using audio or something. But if that's less secure than the main one, then, you know, then, then an attacker will just go and like try to parse the audio file. So you need to, you know, it's only secure as the sort of weakest form. Um, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a real, actual real problem. This is sort of the, the, the a, a big, like no matter how, how good you make your capture, basically your, your capture is going to be, um, uh, vulnerable to this if it's, if it's the kind of CAPTCHA that looks like this, right, where a user types an image into a box. And what this is, is basically when uh, you're trying to do an action on, an, on a victim site as an attacker and you're given a CAPTCHA, what you do is you, uh, you detect that you've been given a CAPTCHA, you take a screenshot of it, and then you as the attacker run some other site that gets a lot of users. So it can be, you know, I don't know, let's say you offer free pirated software or something like that. Uh, they'll offer whatever they can to get users to come to this. Then they'll throw up a CAPTCHA to those users before letting them access the, the content that they want. And that CAPTCHA will come from the site that they're attacking. So they sort of take the picture of it and show it to them and they have these other users solve the CAPTCHA and then in real time they take the answer and put it into the, to the, attack, uh, the, the, the victim site that they're attacking. So uh, yeah, it's, it's like really hard to stop that. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and then there's actually dark market services that offer, um, so if you don't want to be bothered to implement this yourself, you can just call an API and then some attacker will, or some, some uh, sketchy person will do it for you. Um, and uh, this is one of the sites that does this. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty amusing, but you can see the prices are really low. It's like 50 cents for a thousand CAPTCHA solves. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a really, that's, I, I don't know, I feel like that's really cheap. Uh, and um, yeah, so. So this is this is a kind of a kind of a broken system. Uh, one of the things that you, that uh, you, you've seen in uh, that, you, that you see sort of as a response to this is now there's interactive captchas that involve sort of clicking on you know images of traffic lights and things like that, and those are a little bit harder to uh, to just to, to spoof like this because you have to sort of capture all that state and send it across, and it's very interactive. Um, it just makes it harder. I don't know if it makes it impossible. 
Uh, and then this paper came out in 2014, uh, and it's from some people here at Stanford. Um, uh, actually, Ellie was the TA for the, the web security class uh, th that I took uh, as an undergrad. So he's, uh, he's, yeah, he's a TA. He's, he now works at Google as their like, I think head, of, head of privacy and safety or something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, they, they, they wrote this paper in 2014 that basically said all CAPTCHAs that are text-based are just broken. Um, they, they came up with a, an, an, ML an ML algorithm which could just sort of break uh, arbitrary CAPTCHAs uh, uh, and, uh, and, and do it in, like, in one step, like really, uh, really fast. Uh, and I think it says that they broke all existing, see, we were able to solve all real world CAPTCHA schemes. We evaluated accurately enough to consider the scheme insecure in practice. So they broke Yahoo at 5%, reCAPTCHA at 33%, Baidu 38%, you know, CNN at 51%. And so basically, remember, anything above 1% is broken, so they just broke everything. Yeah. And so this is, uh, this is sort of the, like, evolved version that's sort of like, okay, let's get away from text-based because that's broken. What can we do instead? Uh, the idea here is that uh, reCAPTCHA will sort of look at all the behavior uh, of, uh, of the user in the current browser session, so sort of the way they move their mouse, the way they scroll, uh, the IP address that they're coming from, and sort of try to create a trust score for this user. Um, and they, they sort of, since they have these widgets on tons of sites across the internet, they can build up a trust score uh, for, uh, for, um, for like an IP over time so that IP can have reputation. Um, and, um, and if they think that you're sketchy, then they'll throw up sort of a, a, a capture for you. But most of the time, you can just sort of click this box and, and get through. Um, but uh, but um, this is also going away. There's like a new version of this, which doesn't even have any UI at all. It sort of does the same thing without a click. Uh, and that operates kind of completely transparently in the background. Um, and the way, the way that works is that the site that you're uh, interacting with will log attempts to log in and to do various actions on the site with reCAPTCHA and uh, sort of just sort of reporting on everything that you're doing as a user. And uh, over time, this service sort of builds up reputation for like how real of a person is, is this, uh, this user who's interacting with this site. Uh, and uh, so then other services and all, you know, other services that use reCAPTCHA and also your service can sort of query uh, and get sort of a trust score back. And you can make a decision about whether you want to allow the user to do an action or not uh, based on the number you get back. Um, yeah. So, how many people have, have implemented reCAPTCHA on a site and like used it before for anything? Okay. Was it easy to work with? Terrible. Yeah. 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 So this is a good thing to do. Um, good, 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 uh, good solution to sort of dealing with with uh, automated login attempts or any kind of bot doing something on your site that you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. So is like a like corollary, corollary of how we're figuring out I'm a robot that if I use Brave or something like if I'm clicking like that or fingerprinting steps. Yeah, I mean, that's really, yeah, yeah. I think uh, certainly the client side stuff that their code is going to be able to detect is going to look a lot more uniform and a lot like less uh, individualized. And if that's one of their factors that they're looking at, then yeah, you'll look more like a bot. One, one big problem is that this, I mentioned how like they use IP reputation as a way to determine whether you're a real user or not. <coughs> and um, one of the implications of that is that people who are using Tor browser for privacy, uh, they tend to, I mean, they end up using IP addresses which are extremely sketchy because people are doing sketchy stuff on Tor. And so those users end up just getting, getting thrown up uh, ca captures all the time anytime they try to do anything. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're, yeah, it's a little bit uh, not ideal because you're sort of penalizing users to care about their privacy even more. Yeah, and uh, I, don't, I don't know how to solve that. So another thing you can do if you have uh, sensitive features on your site is you can re-authenticate before the user is allowed to use the sensitive feature. So say that, uh, say that you, you, know, you have a form that lets the user change their password or change their email address, or if it's a shopping site, add a new shipping address. One, thing you might, one of the things you might want to do is ask the user to type in their password one more time before they do that. And this is a defense in depth technique that can protect you if your site's vulnerable to XSS or CSRF or session fixation. So if, if any of, of, of your, uh, so if, you, if, you, if you've made a mistake and you, your site is vulnerable to say XSS, and now an attacker can get code in the page, and they can sort of take actions on behalf of the user, well, at least they won't be able to take these actions on behalf of the user because they'll actually need to know the user's password and put that in the request. And so it, it lets them do sort of everything but these sensitive actions. So it's, it's you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's better than nothing. And one of the ways you'll see this is if you ever use GitHub uh, on GitHub when you go to add a collaborator on a project or you go to add an SSH key to your account, any of these really sensitive operations, you'll get thrown up this page here that's like you are entering pseudo mode um, and um, it'll ask you for your password one more time. 
Uh, and then after it does that, it, it won't ask you for a little while. Um, and uh, the other nice thing about this is it actually protects against more than just these sort of web security attacks, but it also protects against physical, uh, temporary physical access to your computer. So if you step away and you forget to lock it and somebody you know, comes in quickly, tries to do something to your account, uh, they at least won't be able to sort of delete your account or change your password or do any kind of other sensitive operation. Again, not perfect, but it's, it's something you might consider for really sensitive things. OK, so um, this is another one that's kind of new. So um, response discrepancy information exposure. This is the idea. It's a fancy, it's really unnecessarily fancy word for basically uh, uh, revealing information that an attacker shouldn't be able to figure out to the attacker. And your user authentication system might do this uh, if, for instance, you, you tell the user who tried to log in, hey, there's no user that has that email address. Or you say, hey, there's, uh, there is a user with that email address, but your password is wrong. Uh, and these different responses can let the attacker learn whether an, an account exists on a service or not. And so, yeah, th basically, basically the idea here is, you know, information exposure is sort of a general term for attacks that leak information to attackers. And then specifically response, uh, oops, specifically response discrepancy is uh, when you respond differently to different responses and you allow an attacker to sort of gain some information about state that they shouldn't have. So it's kind of a side channel attack. Yeah, so, uh, so, so here's an example. So, uh, or here's sort of a way to sort of not have the problem, which is to always respond with generic error messages regardless of whether the user typed in the wrong username or typed in the wrong password or whether the account doesn't even exist at all or whether their account is in some kind of special state like locked or disabled. Just, just don't, don't say anything about this. Just sort of say, like, you know, we can log you in. Um, your username or password was wrong. Uh, and just sort of say that in all cases. Um, and you have to make sure if you're going to do this that you do it on all possible ways that, the, that an attacker might try to get at this information. So don't forget to, to do it for password reset forms and also account creation forms. Um, if you only do it on when a user tries to log in, then of course an attacker could just go to your account creation form, type in a potential email address, and then your account creation form will say um, there's already an account with that email address. Um, so so um, let's go through some examples here. So these are, this would be sort of the wrong way to do it, to say, you know, login for user foo, invalid password, uh, or login failed, invalid user ID, or login failed, account disabled. You're sort of revealing sort of information that an attacker shouldn't necessarily have about the state of the account. Um, or whether that, that, that is a real user on the system. So the best thing to do is just sort of just always say a generic uh, string like this. The problem with this is this is actually kind of annoying for the user, right? Like the user gets less information about what went wrong. Um, that's the trade-off here. It's, uh, it's, it's more annoying for the user. Another case where you could do this is uh, if a user tries to reset an account, you might say, you know, we sent you a password reset link, or, um, you know, this email doesn't exist. Uh, instead, just say, if this email exists, we'll send you a link. Another example is at account creation. You know, don't say this user ID is already in use or, you know, welcome, you've successfully signed up. Just say, uh, you know, uh, just assume it's worked. Uh, if, if they already have an account, I guess this is really annoying for users, though. If they already had an account and you told them you just emailed them, uh, that's not ideal. But, but again, this is the sort of trade-off here between um, disclosing stuff, stuff to a potential attacker and being user-friendly. So it depends, on, it depends really on how, uh, how much you care about this. How bad would it be for an attacker to be able to enumerate all the users that use your service? Right. If I'm, if I'm an attacker and I have a list of email addresses uh, and I go to some bank site and I try logging in with all these email addresses and I look at the different responses and I can figure out uh, this subset of the email addresses are customers of this bank, how bad is that, right? In the case of a bank, that seems pretty bad. I mean, now as a fisher, I can call up these users and I'm, my, my phishing attack is going to be much more effective because I'm going to know they're actually a customer of the bank, right? Um, so yeah, it depends on the service you're building. Uh, and then this is another one that you might forget is actually the HTTP status code can also leak a state difference. So don't forget to, you know, to make sure that the state is consistent. You know, even if you're saying the same message but you're sort of returning a different HTTP code, uh, that's not going to work either. Okay, and then of course timing is always a thing we have to worry about. So uh, what's going on here is this, is this is code that sort of takes a username and password and then decides whether they're valid. And it's bad because there's, uh, there's sort of two different code paths that we take depending on whether the user exists or not. So in the case that the, we look up the user and we see that this is actually a valid username, then we go ahead and hash the password, and then we look up in the database whether the username and the password uh, hash, uh, uh, so, so we hash the password that the user just typed in, and we, we compare that to the, the um, um, uh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, so we, we, hash the user, we hash the password that the user just typed in, and then we, uh, we look up in the database and make sure that that exists. Uh, and then if it does, then go, we go ahead and sort of, uh, we, we say the user is valid. 
But if the user didn't exist at all, we would sort of bail out early. And that if initial if statement would be false, and we would end up down here, and we wouldn't do any of this work. And in particular, this function here is an asynchronous function. That's why you see it wait. And we're talking to a remote database. And that's going to be uh, pretty slow. And so it will be possible for an attacker to sort of just time the difference here and figure out whether the user exists or not. Does everybody see why this is bad? OK, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I think the very least you can do is make sure that you're not sort of adding to the problem here. Um, I don't know how to actually make sure the database takes the same amount of time in that situation. But that's, that's an interesting question to look up, yeah. I, I, I don't know. So the way to rewrite this to make sure that you're not introducing a timing uh, difference between the two code paths is just to make sure that sort of no matter whether the user exists or not, just do, ev do everything in, in both cases, right? Just sort of run the whole code path no matter what. And so we can rewrite it like this, where uh, we just hash the password that the user typed in and look it up in the database. And if it's valid, then it's valid. And we, um, we, we go ahead and um, you know, we, we, uh, we return, or else we throw an error. But this is happening sort of uh, uh, at this point, and it's, it's doing the same work in both cases. So just be aware we're using early returns in authentication code. Um, I think another thing to do would be to sort of empirically test this. Like, if you're building a service where this actually matters, um, you know, you, you sort of have to test your system because you're totally right that it could, you know the database could take a different amount of time. And if you if you notice that, then you're gonna have to try and do something to to mitigate it. Um, yeah, but yeah, basically the the main point here is just that mitigation these mitigations have trade offs, and the user experience will definitely be worse if you're uh, if you're giving the user generic error messages and not specific messages, and it can totally frustrate legitimate users. Like I've been in a situation where I've had an I know I had an account on a site, but I don't remember what email I used, and I'm trying the different emails, and I'm getting the same message saying you know either your username or your password is wrong, and I'm like I don't know now what, what to do, you know. So so that, that that's that is really annoying. Um, one thing you can do if you, if you just don't want to go there, you, know, you don't want to make the user experience worse, is you can just rate limit the authentication attempts so that you can say, all right, if somebody wants to enumerate whether like I, like for us, specifically has an account on Bank of America, then they're going to be able to do that. Like just print them a friendly error message, right? Say like, oh, this username exists or it doesn't exist or whatever. But, uh, but rate limit it so that at least they won't be able to do this at scale. Uh, and that's, that's like sort of one trade-off you can, you can make. Um, so you still get friendly error messages, but you just don't let them try this for like thousands of accounts, right? Yeah. Okay. Before we go on, any questions about this stuff? Yeah. What's like a good um, like rate like limit algorithm? Uh, I mean, whatever he, you think uh, the fastest possible human would be, right? <laughs> um, you also have to keep in mind that uh, that there could be multiple people sharing the same IP address. And so, if you set it too low, then you know you'll you'll prevent um, you'll prevent like you know a corporate network where they have 100 people all sharing an IP from from logging in. Um, so, I, I my rule of thumb is like just set it like a couple like maybe an order of magnitude more than you think the most extreme user would ever do. And then if you notice people are getting blocked, then you can consider raising it more. But you know if you just give a ton of space, that you know that no normal user will probably hit the limit. But then um, bots are going to be like way above the limit anyway, so they'll definitely trigger it, right? Um, but yeah, it's uh, something you kind of have to test, I think. Yeah, okay, so now let's talk about data breaches. So this is the kind of the stuff you see in the news all the time. Um, the most sort of big example from this year is the Equifax data breach, where they lost 143 million U.S. customers' information. In particular, it was really bad because they lost social security numbers. Uh, and so if you're an American citizen, and even if you were maybe a U.K. citizen or a Canadian citizen, uh, then... I don't know what the equivalent of social security number is in those countries, but in, at least in the U.S., uh, there's a very good chance that if you're in the U.S., uh, your social security number is just in a breach somewhere, and somebody can go buy it now. Um, so that is very disconcerting. Um, and by the way, this is t tangential, but you can lock your credit, uh, and that will actually help quite a bit uh, against this kind of stuff. So you can Google that if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, uh, another one that happened, uh, this was like a few years ago, is uh, Yahoo got hacked. And they said a billion uh, user accounts were hacked. And then it came out later that it was actually 3 billion. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of examples of these th things happening. Um, and so here's a list of like some of the biggest ones that I could find. Um, yeah, Yahoo, 3 billion is the biggest. 
Uh, but like lots of companies on here that you would think know what they're doing, um, you know, uh, still get breached. Uh, so like you know, Dropbox, Facebook, Quora. These are some companies that are local here that you might know. Um, uh, you know, this typically happens because they uh, had a server somewhere that was misconfigured uh, that allowed people to just connect to the server and read the data on it, uh, or uh, maybe. You know, maybe there was a command injection or a SQL injection attack. We talked about those earlier, uh, and an attacker was able to get on a server. Um, and you know, even if this data this data is in a database server somewhere else, you know, once they're on an, 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 an on an app server, um, they might be able to sort of uh, pivot their way to other servers that are accessible from that server and get to the database and then exfiltrate all the data. Um, and so it, sometimes it's really dumb. Sometimes it's as dumb as uh, as like somebody left their S3 bucket public instead of private. So if you're putting a bunch of data somewhere in an S3 bucket, which is just like a static file host, and you say like, oh, anyone can access it, then when someone finds the URL, they're going to be able to download everything. Um, yeah, so it can happen for a whole bunch of reasons, um, kind of beyond the scope of, uh, of this lecture. But, uh, but yeah, if you assume that these are out there, right, how do you protect the users on your site, um, given that this info is out there? Right, so like one thing you, you might think of is like maybe if I, um, I look at the data in these breaches, I'll be able to sort of proactively figure out if any of my users on my service are reusing a password that was in a breach you know, on, on my site. And then if so, I, can, I, I know that that user is very vulnerable, right? Now, because now, now attackers have that password and they have that username and they might try it on the site. So you can sort of proactively lock their account. That's something you can look into doing. Uh, and, and you can do things like that. Um, so let's talk about... Uh, a little bit more about breaches. So, so were you in, you know, are you in a breach? Probably yes. Probably all of you have, are in existing breaches that have happened. Um, there's a service you can use to check this. How many of you have heard of Have I Been Pwned? OK, so uh, I'll just show it for the, for the benefit of the rest of you. Um, this is a really great site. Go check it out. It's haveibeenpwned.com. You can type in your email address. I'll just type in mine, um, be, the, be public. And by the way, there's nothing, you did nothing wrong if you end up in this list here. right? It's not like I did something wrong. So I'm not embarrassed to show you this. Um, but this is, this is public information. Um, basically, there's these, these different companies that apparently I, I either do biz I did business with at one point in time or uh, that had information about me because I, I ended up in their, in their database somehow. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, all of these different companies ha were breached and my information was leaked. And you can see sort of in each case what exactly was lost. So yeah, Tumblr, that was probably actually me. Um, <laughs> Email addresses and passwords were compromised in that situation. Um, but yeah, look this up for yourself. You can also set up a, an alert so that um, any time a breach happens, you'll get an email. And then you can, uh, you can then know, ah, whatever password was I used for that site is now insecure. I should go change it anywhere else I'm using it. Um, yeah, and then this service is also really useful uh, as a site builder because you can, you can, like I said before, you can check this service to see if a, a password that a user is about to use on your site is in, the, in a breach. And then you can decide whether to allow them to, to use that password or not. Uh, password managers can also do this as well. They can, uh, they can alert you if, if your password's in a breach. So yeah, really, really cool service. Um, OK, so now let's talk about how to store passwords. So uh, the first thing to know is, uh, and this is going to be obvious, but never ever store passwords in plain text. So in a data breach, the attacker is going to learn whatever is in the database, right? So if you store your passwords in plain text, that means the attacker is going to get a dump of all your users' passwords, and they're going to be able to attack that user's accounts on all the other sites that they use, where they reuse that password. And because people are humans, they're very likely reusing that, that password a lot. So this is an example of just literally, like, you can, I don't necessarily want to encourage you to, to go looking for these things, but you can, this is like, a, like in a two-minute Google search, I found a, a paste bin, which is, a paste bin is a site where, where people who, um, breach services typically like to go and dump sort of proof of like what they hacked. And so this is an example of someone posting a sort of a, le a proof that they leaked, uh, that they hacked a Twitter database or that they have access to the, to the database in some way. And they're offering to sell access to this or to basically send you this file um, for, for half a Bitcoin. Um, and uh, the leak includes sort of emails and passwords. I tried to redact the usernames and passwords, but like, yeah, the, the, actual, the actual file has the real stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they'll send it to you for, for qu quite, a, quite an affordable uh, amount for, for 32 million account, uh, account passwords. Um, yeah, so this is, this is what happens when you store stuff in plain text. Not good. Uh, and it's also really embarrassing if you get hacked and people found, find out that you were storing passwords in plain text. It's like, it really, it's just, don't be that person. So this is like, uh, you know, what the user table might look like if you were doing this. So the passwords are all there. Any developer at your company or any attacker can see. 
Um, so how do, we, how do we fix this? Well, we need to hash the plain text password and then store only the hash in the database. So we use the crypt cryptographic hash function for this. I mentioned uh, a little bit about this before, but just to review, these are the properties of, of hash function. Um, and in particular, we, we care a lot about uh, only four of, the, we, four of the properties. We don't really need quick to compute. And, and in fact, actually, that's, that's a bit of a, that's actually bad in the case of a, of a hash function for passwords. We actually want it to be slow to compute. So an attacker who's, who has the database and is trying uh, to, to crack passwords will actually have to go slower. But uh, the, other, the other properties are all important. For, um, for a hash function we're using in a, in a database um, for authentication. Um, so this is some code you might write. So, uh, so let's say we, so this is Node, so we're gonna use the crypto library and we'll call create hash and we'll say that we're, we, wanna, wanna, we wanna use a SHA-256 hash. And uh, the way that, that this uh, function works is it, it gives you back a, a hash object that has an update and a digest uh, method on it. And so update, you sort of just provide data progressively to the, um, uh, to the object, and then eventually when you're ready to sort of get the hash, you call digest. And so this will give us back the hash. Uh, uh, and so we just sort of define a little helpful function here called SHA-256 that we're gonna use later down here. Um, and so then when a user actually gives us a password, we just SHA-256 hash the password and we insert that into the database. And so this is sort of uh, an improvement over storing the passwords in plain text. Now later when a user comes to authenticate, we actually need to check to see if it's valid. And so, uh, so now some user is, is claiming to be this uh, user and they were gonna provide us a password and we're gonna, sh we're gonna hash it and compare it to the hash that we saved in the database. Yeah? I'm a little confused here. Um, so is the SHA-256 um, the same for all users or? Yeah, so one of the properties of the hash function is that it's, uh, uh, it's deterministic. So uh, basically any message, anytime you put a string in, um, if you put the same string in again later, you're gonna get the same uh, output, the same hash value. Yeah, that's really important, yeah, good point. It's the same for every user. So um, and that's okay because hopefully the users are picking different passwords, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, the main thing is that we want it to be the case that when the user comes along later and presents another, like, a, a, you know, pr presents uh, a later password, a, a login attempt, uh, we want that, that this function is gonna return the same hash that it, it returned before, right? Uh, and then we'll know that it's them. Yeah, cool. So okay, so that's that's uh, that's an improvement. Um, so now this is what our table looks like. So we've stored sort of all this uh, these these hash values as our passwords. Um, that's definitely better. Um, there's something that's not ideal about this though. Um, can anyone spot it? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like the people who know where I'm going with this are going to have a little easier time. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because the SHA-256 function is deterministic. If we put the same password in twice, we're gonna get the same hash value out twice. And so uh, we're, we can, look, just looking at this database, we can spot that Dakota and Bob both have the same password, even though we don't know what it is, because this hash here and this hash here is, is, is identical. And so this is not good. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to, to see that. And there's another problem with that too, which is that uh, in addition to spotting, yeah, in addition to spotting identical passwords, or, or, or at least spotting users who have identical passwords, we can also do pre-computed lookup attacks. And so the idea of a pre-computed pre lookup attack is, say I know in advance that uh, this site that I want to, you know, the site that I want to attack uses SHA-256 as their hash function. I can, as an attacker, in advance, go and try all the common passwords, put them through this hash function, and then save the outputs in a database. And then later, when I actually get my hands on the database, I can uh, go through all the users and just, for each user, I take the hash and I compare it to my database and see if it exists in that set. And if it does, then I know exactly what password uh, they're using because I produced that set and I saved sort of the original password alongside the output in my own little copy. Uh, and so it means that sort of it, it, it's possible to attack sort of all the users in the database uh, at once uh, by building up this pre-computed table. Um, and, and sort of effectively, for, for everything that ends up in your table, you can reverse the, the hash functions for, for just for those entries. And so that's really not good. So we want some way to sort of defend against this. Um, and so does everybody understand the problem here? Ask questions if you don't. Okay, I think no one raised their hand. Okay, so uh, the solution is password salts. So password salts prevent two users who use identical passwords from, uh, from being revealed or being identified. And it also adds entropy to weak passwords uh, that, and make, makes the pre-computed lookup attack not work. So uh, all assault is, it's literally a randomly chosen value. It's crypt cryptographically randomly chosen. So it's a strong randomness. And uh, typically it's like some short amount of bytes, like 16 bytes or 32 bytes or something like that. You just pick this value randomly. And what you do is you uh, concatenate it to the password before you put it through the hash function. Okay, so I chose some random value and I, 
and I add it to the user's password, and then the output, that's what I store in the database. Now, the problem with that is that now, the next time the user comes along and provides me their password, I need to be sure that, there's, that I'm going to be able to, uh, to, to test that it's correct. And so I need to know the salt, because I need to take their, their password attempt and combine it with the salt again in the same way and produce this sort of new hash and then compare it to what's in the database, right? And so for that reason, the salt actually gets stored alongside the password in the database. It doesn't need to be kept secret. It just sort of sits there next to the password in the database. So, uh, so uh, let's just quickly show what, this is what it would look like in the database. So now I generated these salts, and I did this at the time that the user created their account. So they all have different salts. And, uh, and now, um, because their password got combined with the salt uh, uh, before I generated the hash, this is what our hashes look like now. So they're different, even though these two users have the same, actually they have the same password. Right. So, uh, so this is the code to do, to do that. So, so uh, it's it's really similar to the previous uh, the previous code. The only difference is now we're actually generating this random uh, value here. This is just a string um, that's randomly chosen, and we combine that random string with the user's password to produce their hash. And uh, and then when we go to store the hash, we also store the salt alongside it in the database. Uh, and then again, to 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 validate it later, we need to make sure we repeat the same steps. So we we, we take the salt and combine it with the password attempt that this user is making, and then if the hash matches, then we know we found, we found the real user. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, so that's salting. Um, and if you don't want to do all this yourself, you can just use bcrypt. So bcrypt is a library that does, basically does this for you. Um, it was designed by uh, Niels Provost and David Mazieres. David, Ma David Mazieres is a lecturer here, or sorry, professor here. Um, uh, and um, it's been around for many years. I think it's like over 10 years now. And there's been no issues found with it, really. So it's, uh, even though it's old, it's somehow still, um, wait, 11 years? Maybe more than that. 20 years, I think. I think it was like, I, I need to look that up. I think it was like 2000 something. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, the, 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 um, some of the things it gives you is it has a really expensive key setup algorithm. So uh, that means that when someone goes to use bcrypt, it's going to take a lot longer. Uh, and you, you don't really want speed in a, in a password hashing function anyway. So this is actually good for us. Um, and then we also, uh, we also don't have to worry about salting anymore um, because the bcrypt library itself will generate a salt at the time that we create an account and then include that in the, in the output. And so when we write our code, we can just do something like this. So notice the, the salt stuff is gone. So all we're doing is saying, hey, we want to use bcrypt. Here's the password that the user um, gave us when they're creating their account. And uh, there's this new thing called hash rounds, which is sort of a, a hardness number. Uh, the, more, the more you increase the number of rounds, the more sort of uh, long this, this function takes to run. Um, but um, anyway, we, uh, so we call this function, and uh, we get out a, a hash. Uh, but in fact, this string here contains a salt as well. Uh, it's embedded in there. Uh, and so when we go to store this in the database, we actually are storing the salt and the password uh, a hash, uh, both in the database. Uh, and then later, to actually compare, we actually can't do it on our own now because we don't know how to parse this sort of string that bcrypt produced, so we're actually going to rely on the bcrypt library to do that for us. So when we get a password, this is a plain text password, we, um, and we have this hash here that includes the salt in it, uh, we actually ask bcrypt to go ahead and compare the two. And so what it does is it'll look at this string, and the string will contain the salt, and it will contain uh, um, the information about the number of iterations. The number 10 up there will be in there as well. Um, and, um, and then it will, it, will, it will make sure to, to process this plain text password in the same way um, and, and then compare the result to that, to that stored hash. So if we were to look at the database, this is what we'd see. Um, you'll notice that uh, the number 10 is present in these hashes because of the fact that we chose 10 iterations. And then you'll notice also that they all start with dollar uh, sign two b dollar sign, and that's just a uh, sort of uh, I can't remember what uh, what operating system came up with the standard, but this basically just says this is a bcrypt hash. Um, uh, and then uh, and then the, the the next thing that follows this dollar sign here is the salt, and I don't I don't actually know how many bytes it is, but there's um, there's some pre predetermined number of bytes here that is actually the salt, and then finally the password hash is is, is the rest, um, and so that's all in there, and bcrypt knows how to sort of pull that out. Okay, so, so um, what would an attacker actually do if they got their hands on a database like this? So a bcrypt, like, like a, well, uh, a, 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 a database where the uh, developers did everything right. What would they do? So this is really terrifying. Uh, Microsoft put out uh, uh, some, 
a paper or a, I think it was a, actually it was a blog post. Maybe there was a paper that went with it, but uh, I read the blog post and it uh, sort of goes through what an attacker would do and what the costs are for things today in 2019. And this terrified me. So basically, you can get a machine capable of cracking 100 billion passwords per second against SHA-256. Uh, so this is not Bcrypt, but it's, it's SHA-256, which is, happens to be what Microsoft uses for their, um, for their um, uh, password storage. And you can build that for $20,000. So billion, that's 100 billion passwords for $20,000. Uh, and that's as of July 2019. And so their sort of proposed strategy for how one would, would, would go about breaking, uh, breaking passwords in a dump where the dump looks like this, right? Where you don't actually know what password Dakota chose, but you want to find out what password Dakota chose. You would start by looking at every password disclosed in a breach where the breach, was, uh, the breach included plain text passwords. So you start with that as your starting list. And you can think of it like this is every password that anyone's ever thought of, right? Um, it's a huge list of real passwords that people chose. And statistically, they, cl they claim that that would break 70% of actual user passwords because uh, people are, not, are just not that creative. And so now you have this list of 500 million passwords. And because you can crack 100 billion in a second, you can actually attempt 200 accounts per second. So you go through that list, that you, you go through this database here, basically, and you try to see is any of these on that, on that list of uh, breached passwords. And you're going you're gonna to get 70% success rate just by doing that. And then if you wanted to make it better, they, 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 they uh, suggest going for song lyrics and news headlines and other sort of strings that users might choose and adding that to your, to your set. And you can sort of eke out a little bit more uh, success, another like 5% or so. Um, but, but yeah, this is really terrifying. Um, so, so even if we do everything right um, and, uh, and we're breached, our users are kind of screwed, right? Um, it's really not good. Uh, so uh, basically, um, I think the main thing to, get, to focus back on is just how do we, what do we do in, the, in, the, in spite of this? Like, what do we, what do, we do uh, uh, you know, given that uh, some attacker is going to be able to get this database, and they're going to be able to, uh, you know, let's assume an email address for Dakota was in here. Uh, they're going to be able to figure out what, pa what password Dakota actually uses, and they're going to be able to come to our site and try to attempt to log in with that username or that email address and that password. What are we going to do? Well, we can do multi-factor authentication. That's one uh, sort of uh, a strategy. Um, and in that same post, Microsoft claims that you know, in this post, they were sort of trying to claim that passwords are broken. Like, you know, it doesn't matter what password you choose, basically. They were saying it really doesn't matter. Your password is already known to the attacker, so just choose anything, <laughs> effectively, is what they were saying. Uh, but but uh, they, say, they claim that if you use uh, MFA or multi-factor authentication, your account is uh, way less likely, 99.9% .9 less likely to be uh, compromised. Uh, so so, so let's, let's look into MFA. You know, and, and MFA is you know, back to our sort of additional factors we talked about before. We want something in addition to a password. So we want something that the user has or something that they are. And we want them to present that to us so we know that it's them in addition to their password. And so, um, so, so uh, what exactly... Uh, if we just have a strong password, uh, what, what are we actually protected against? Well, these two are the two things we're protected against with a strong password alone. So uh, somebody can try and guess or uh, you know, spray passwords. They can sort of use the list of insecure passwords and try to find ours. But if ours is really, really strong, it's like you know, some huge number of characters, they're not going to be able to get our password. Um, they're also not going to be able to brute force um, either. But, uh, but if we're looking at sort of the normal user case, um, oh, actually, before I say that, so even if you choose a strong password, um, you're not protected against all of these attacks up here, right? So if, if, your, if your password was reused and it was in another breach, then you're going you're to be vulnerable because they're going to be able to do credential stuffing. Um, if you get phished or man in the middle in some way or your, your, your um, computer has malware on it and your keystrokes get logged or you're extorted or somebody literally finds it written on a, on a, on a, on a um, post-it note or something like that, none of these things are going to protect you, even if you have a strong password. But if you don't even have a strong password, then you're sort of vulnerable to all of these things. Um, so, so passwords, the point is passwords alone are not enough. And so um, we want to require a second factor in some way. Now, if you're a little concerned about requiring a user to sort of present a, a code from their phone or something like that every time they log in, you might consider only requiring it in certain situations when you've detected that the user is behaving suspiciously in some way. So, uh, a common pattern you'll see is that it, uh, a site will uh, keep track of a browser that it's seen by cookieing the browser, and then it will only require the second factor when it sees that a browser has shown up without that cookie present. So it's, in other words, it's a new device, right? Um, or you can save all the IP addresses that the user's ever logged in from and sort of prompt them anytime they're at a new location. Um, 
You could also sort of prompt them if it's the first time they've logged in from a certain country or certain location. Um, or you can use the IP addresses, uh, uh, the, the IP address of the user and look it up on a list uh, of suspicious IPs. Uh, so you can, um, you can download these lists. They're publicly available and they're maintained sort of collectively by the community of, of, of site operators who, who do this stuff. And you can sort of just say, if, if the IP is on this list, I'm just gonna throw up a, I'm gonna force a two-factor, uh, um, uh, I'm gonna require this particular user to, to prove that they have a second factor before I allow them into the account, right? Um, Another really easy thing to do is just like save uh, sort of IP addresses and then what accounts they've tried to log into. And if you see like one person try to log into an account, like ten, or sorry, if you see one person try to log into like 10 different accounts in one minute, that's probably not a real person, right? Who logs into 10 accounts in t within like a minute, right? So uh, behavior like that is, is like, is like a pretty easy to spot. Um, and then, of course, there's other ways you can try to detect that something is a script and not like a real user. You maybe look at the user agent or you look at sort of other behavior, behavioral uh, things about their, their um, browsing. Okay, so um, I want to talk, uh, I want to end with just sort of uh, one example of, of how to implement a uh, second factor. So a really common second factor that you'll see is uh, TOTP or time-based one-time passwords. And so the um, way this works is, this is not the SMS version that you might have seen before. This is sort of like you have an authenticator app on your phone. This is Google Authenticator. This is an example of uh, one app that you can do it with. And uh, typically the way it works is the user takes their phone and they scan a QR code presented to them by the website. And then their phone gets uh, a six digit code that rotates every 30 seconds that they will uh, present to the site when they want to prove that they ha they're in possession of this device. Or they're, you know, this is their second factor, basically. Um, and so what this, what this QR code actually is, is it's a secret key. It's a shared secret that's going to be shared between the server and between this, this phone here. Um, and the secret key is used in combination with, uh, I'll, I'll mention it in the, on the next slide, but it's, uh, it gets put through a um, HMAC function and uh, through a couple of other steps, and then you end up with a code that comes out, basically. And this proves to the server that, uh, that you are in possession of this, this shared secret, basically. Um, and so you, uh, you, you can just present that to the server anytime you want to pr prove that you have that second factor. So this is sort of the rough idea of what we want to do. So the server is going to create a secret key that's specific to this user. Uh, it needs to obviously be different for every user. And uh, then it shares that secret key with the user's phone app in some way. And typically, it's just a QR code uh, like, like that. And uh, then the phone app is going to initialize some kind of a counter. And it's going to use that to make sure that the code changes over time. And it puts the counter along with the secret key through uh, some kind of a function. And then we get out a one-time password. And then the, the user can provide that one-time password to the site. Um, and then it sort of regenerates this uh, every, every 30 seconds by sort of incrementing the counter. Yeah. Is the whole of the, the private part of the setup is just in that QR code? Like if we got a picture of the screen like that, they could have been presented yes. directly that way? Yes. Yep, that's it. Yep, the QR code is really sensitive. It's, it is, it is uh, literally stored on the phone, and it's a, it's a shared secret. Yeah, yep, totally, yep. Uh, and I mean, this is just some this is just some like random value that the server chose. Like you can also get it as a manual form typically, and you can just see the bytes that the server chose. But it's completely random. Yeah. But the authenticator doesn't say like, "Hi, I'm, I'm an authenticator, and I just saw a QR code from your existing server." Nope, it's completely offline. Yeah, yeah. So this 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 yeah. app this app never talks to the server. In fact, I mean, this app's in airplane mode. <laughs> but this app literally just sort of completely deterministically just takes this counter and plus plus the secret key that it got in this QR code and puts it through a function and then increments the counter every thirty seconds. Right. That's all it's doing. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the server can verify that you that you are this, that you are actually in possession of this key by itself doing the same thing. So it needs to also have a, a counter that's set, set to the same counter that the phone is set to. And so you can sort of see where I'm going with this. What's a good counter that sort of both the server and the phone would have that would allow them to both know what counter we're using, even though the, this phone doesn't have internet, right? Like this phone is in airplane mode. Time. time. Yeah, time. Exactly. So they both have the time. And so what we do is, this is actually the, the oh, okay, this is the first step where you create the secret key. So what you do is, the server is just going to pick some random bytes, and then it's going to add it to the database for this user. So, you know, this user's in the database somewhere, we're just going to add a, an entry in a column that's like, this is their, this is their, their one-time code key, right? And then now we give it to the user via the QR code. And then when the user actually wants to uh, uh, generate a code, what they do is they take the current time, and they divide it by 30 seconds, and that gives us the counter. And then they run that through the HMAC function, where they use the secret key. Basically, it's a combination of the secret key and the counter. And then they produce a hash. 
And now we need, this hash is really long, so we just do a few steps here. The details are not important. But we effectively choose a couple of bytes, uh, some bytes from the hash, and then we mod it by the number of characters we want to show to the user. So we want it to be a six-digit code. And so we just sort of mod it by 10 to the sixth, and that gives us our, our code that we're going to present. Uh, and that's it. And the server has to do the same thing. So the server sort of goes through the same process and compares it to this. And if they're the same, then it knows that we must be, um, the user must have the second, device, the second factor on, on hand. Right. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So the final thoughts are just remember always hash and salt your passwords uh, or just use bcrypt. That's, uh, that's a really easy way to go. Um, you, you, you know, it's hard to go wrong if you do that. Um, and keep in mind, you know, depending on the kind of site you're building, uh, think about ways to protect users even when the attacker has, sort of has their password and, and has everything. Right? What can we do to protect the user even in that situation? And hopefully some of, some of the things we talked about here are ideas to get you started on, on ways to protect your users. Thanks.